Hey guys, welcome back to the Elevate HD podcast. This is episode 14, and today I am joined by James Sutton. Now, James Sutton is the co-founder of the PT Project. He's an online physique coach, and he's also an educator and a mentor, and he has educated and mentored me on many occasions. So we go back a number of years now. Um, I think the first time I met James was October 2019 when I went to my first exercise mechanics seminar. Uh, so it's been a while, and I've learned a lot from him uh, since that time. So yeah, so James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. No problem. So let's go back to the beginning. So what made you get into the fitness industry? Because I think it's so funny, like seeing the contrast between you now and how you began and like the bro ways of doing things that you started out with, I think is it's really interesting, like the journey that you've had since the beginning. So like what made you get into it to start with? Obviously, it's going back 15 slightly more years <laughs> so it's a good few years and I think at that time it, it, there was no deep life mission or p- deep purpose or anything like that it was for the fact that I like being around people I was passionate about training um and I'd failed at other things <laughs> and I was like I need to try and push something that really I think can be a success and can think move forward and like early 20s the fitness industry wasn't what it is now like you just didn't make a or probably a long-term successful career as a PT. So it's something I got into, but not something I envisioned 15 plus years later um, that it could turn into in a sense what it has. So it's literally the fact that I already at that age trained for eight, nine, 10 years, trained since I was 13, 14 year old, years old, tried to pursue a career in sort of basketball that hadn't really worked wasn't good enough um and I was like I actually sometimes enjoyed training more than playing basketball um and I always had people come into us asking for advice and stuff like that and I was like oh, I think I can do something with this and I can leverage it um a little bit but more but it, it was no more than that at the time it was just like oh, I think I, I like being around people I think I can communicate okay with people um let's see what I can do with this let's see if I can work in the industry for, for a few years um and at that time, I said there wasn't all the other avenues of, of income or you didn't, the industry in a sense wasn't the same size as maybe it is now. So it was no, oh yeah, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, I'm going to do this, achieve this, help these hundreds of thousands of people, whatever it is. It was like, no, let me just get into it and get it going. Um, so it was, it was no deeper, no more than just, I like being around people and I'm passionate about training. I think that's a really like, undervalued skill of a trainer is like your people skills and your communication skills because you can have all the knowledge and be the best trainer and have the best physique in the world but if you can't communicate that to a client then it's pretty much useless isn't it oh yeah 100 percent. and when it comes comes down to it communication and ability to build rapport are the two most important things really to be a successful coach yeah um yes the other things will take you up obviously another level but if you haven't got them two foundations in there you're not even gonna be able to get things moving get things going at all where you can survive and make a a reasonable living from it yeah like your clients need to like you they need to be they need to enjoy being around you and spending time with you that's kind of half the battle really isn't it especially if you're an in-person pt and they they want to look you want them to look forward to showing up and being there or else like they're back in their feet and like oh god here's another pt session like that's obviously not ideal yeah 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 if you're spending one two three hours a week uh, with someone then that that rapport that connection that communication there has to be there um but it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't have to be there online it, it does to a still a high level but just obviously in a different different way um because if we haven't got ability to build any rapport or trust or communication then like we're soon going to lose a client a client's not going to stay with us so then we don't get that end result obviously what they maybe signed up for yeah definitely so once you've got into the fitness industry now obviously you're very passionate about education and kind of teaching you know other fitness professionals um more about training and biomechanics and exercise mechanics everything like that so what kind of sparked your interest first in kind of transitioning more into the education side of things and not just pure coaching um i think going back to the the start and the start of the industry it probably almost came from a place of insecurity of not feeling i knew enough um, not being happy with the results I got with clients or feeling I could get better results. Um, and then also from the training aspect side of stuff, thinking there's another way, thinking there's a better way. So I'd already trained bodybuilding, didn't look like a bodybuilder, but I could say I could train train bodybuilding for eight or so years prior to getting into the fitness industry. 
So I thought, oh, there's got to be a, a better way. And that moved me down an educational route of, I call it functional training, uh, more movement-based stuff, which was around, then disappeared, but now seems to be coming back a lot with some of the people who are doing education and mentorship and, and stuff there. Um, so there's the training side of stuff that moved more functional and moved away from what I'd actually really got into and what I loved. And it wasn't until probably eight years or so into the industry that then I discovered RTS. And just got actually, if I just really learn what training is, really learn biomechanics and understand that fully, then I can go back to how I say love to train, but with a more educated approach to it. Um, so it was I more became an educator, got into the education side of stuff from just years and years in the early days of doing different courses. Did my PT course straight away, did I think it was NASAM performance enhancement specialist. Did that as soon as I did that, I think it was the premier masters or some premier one that was after that then did a, a gift which was with the gray institute which is basically out in america which was 10 grand course two years in the industry didn't have the money got a loan wow. <laughs> <laughs> involved three trips out to the states so straight away was getting in debt <laughs> just to try and further my education then from there i think it went down polycrim route doing all biosig picp then from where there went like functional diagnostic nutrition and functional medicine university and in like the functional medicine side of stuff because that's what polyquin was started talking about within biosig and stuff like that so it, each course would lead into another course which would lead into another course and it was just a continued education there in the early days and i think as i say that came from a place of probably insecurity on my own part not knowing enough yeah. and not feeling i got good enough results from my clients or feeling i could get better results from my clients um, and it was only after six years or so, I think it was six years, working then transitioned to work to M10, um, a year or two working there. And Mark Coles pushed us in the limelight in a sense and say we um, sort of started the education program or he started the education program and I assisted him um, with that. So it was almost pushed to the forefront by Mark Coles. So um I can't thank him enough for putting me out there because if I hadn't had someone push me forward, I'd probably the type of person I am would have just sat back and not started educating. Um, He's just so I think an incredible the, individual because he just calls you out on your shit and he just expects nothing than uh, except the best from you and he won't take any excuses or anything like that. He's like, I don't care. <laughs> so it really makes you like level up because I'm obviously, I'm doing a business mentorship with him at the moment and he just expects so much from you, but you have to deliver on that because you don't want to let him down because you respect him so much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've known Mark for well, 15, 16 years since I got into the industry. Um, so we'd already known each other for six or so years before working with him um, for five, six years, obviously at M10. Um, so it's, he sort of led me into the route of educating coaches, educating PTs. Um, and I was like, actually, yeah, really enjoy this. When I continue this, even after my journey finished at M10, but I want to find a way to continue this. And obviously that initially started with working alongside Callum because Callum had been with us at M10, so continued, obviously, under the Muscle Mentors brand. Um, and now myself and Paul have got the PTT project. Yeah, it's it's been a very interesting journey. Like, I was kind of similar to you from the beginning, where I felt that I never knew enough. Um, but because of that, I never started coaching. So I was like, if I just do more courses, do more courses, do more courses, eventually I'll feel like I, I'm ready to start. But obviously that never happens, because it's like a Dunning-Kruger effect. Like, the more you learn, the less you think you know. So it's like, then the spiral of like, oh my God, there's so much I can learn. Um, so you just kind of have to get started and kind of, obviously you need to continue your education throughout the process and not ju just in the beginning. So that's, that's very important. And also I find that like your clients also dictate what you should learn about as well. You, if they come up with problems or, or you troubleshoot things or identify things with them, it gives you that kind of spark to, okay, I need to go and, and research this um, to be a better coach for them. Um, but yeah. another... I'd say it was to, it's either your clients or yourself. Yeah. Because if there's certain, I don't know, injuries, then you might go a bit more down the rehab route. If you've got messed up digestion, then you might start to delve into that and look at that a little bit more. If you're fatigued and burnt out or overtrained or been, uh, then that's going to take you down into certain abilities sort of to manage recovery. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot for me, it's almost a selfish thing as well as yes i want to understand more about my clients but part of that was dictated well actually i want to excel myself yeah. i want to make sure that say in all areas of my my life say my physique or mindset and wise that i can really sort of excel that so it's 
yes, it's a partly a selfish thing and partly down to clients um, as well. But I think, as you said, that to, you've got to get started. Yeah. otherwise you're just going to continue to learn and learn and learn and realize shit there's this other avenue i need to go down there's another rabbit hole that i'm going to get sort of get lost in when really you've got to apply it I know. um and as, as much as we both love education we're passionate about it so much of that it isn't required for the result mm. in the early days yeah. it, as we get deeper into coaching and odd aspects are going to be required at different times but we can get a lot of the results with the foundational knowledge, foundational understanding, ability to build rapport and build and understand the foundations. But it's always that deeper level is going to help us get results with that individual different client who at some point gets stuck in a certain area or they've had a coach before but hasn't succeeded. Um, so it's it's partly for our own passion and own benefit. I think that we continue to educate and we continue to study run directly for our clients. Yeah, like as you said, like from a selfish perspective, I was kind of succumbing to this false idea of, oh, I just have terrible genetics. I'm never going to build any muscle. Um, but I decided to not let that limit my abilities and, and the results I wanted to achieve and find out why, you know, why, why was I not building the muscle I want to, you know, looking at my training, looking at my exercise selection and, and learning, you know, why is this movement potentially suboptimal and how could I adjust it to make it better to match me and my abilities? Um, because obviously before that I was just going in, I was just doing a plan that my coach had given me with probably no kind of thought process into mechanics or my structure or anything to do with me as a person. Um, so obviously I wasn't going to grow optimally when I didn't have that knowledge myself or my coach didn't have that knowledge themselves. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think once you have that understanding, then it, it can get that extra 5% sometimes that it just wasn't possible without it. Mm. So, and like you said, what I think is really important for people to realize is that there's not two camps. There isn't like an evidence-based camp and a results-driven camp. Like they're very much, you know, correlated and combined. Like you can't just separate them because just because we enjoy research, we like to study, we like to educate ourselves doesn't mean that we get, we don't get our clients results because that is one of the driving factors as to why we educate ourselves. I think a lot of kind of old school bodybuilding coaches say you know just keep it simple just do do the basics and and that will pay off but as you said for a lot of people yes that might be enough but then what about someone who has an injury or they have a weakness or they have imbalances or they have lagging body parts and this is where the education has to come into play because you need to be a detective and you need to be uh, able to troubleshoot these things yeah. And once you've gone to a level of diving deep into the education, say if it's obviously biomechanics, exercise mechanics world, the application can be simple, but unless you know the deeper understanding, you don't quite know why you're applying stuff. So there's something like a leg extension. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we know you just sit on there, move your legs up and down, but actually to apply that optimally and to make sure you can get the most from that and stay in the game five years, 10 years, 15 years, let alone obviously work with a client who's maybe got some previous sport injuries. There's so many finer details that we need to be aware of. So from the outside, it can look so simple. And from the little cue that we give to a client or how to apply it can be so simple, but we've got that deeper understanding of one, what's going on obviously with the machine. Um, and then two, what's going on with ourselves, joint-wise, muscular system-wise. Um, and it's when we can bring them all together and a, a simple tweak, a simple cue, a simple application can make so much difference from how that is experienced from the client. Um, so yes, the application is so simple, but the foundation understanding of that has to be at a, a deeper level, really. Yeah, it's kind of come back to, you know, what Michael Golden says about think science, speak client, because I know he's given an anecdote before where he has a client that, he needs to put him in a specific position and he'll just say something like penguin and the, and the client knows exactly what position to be in for that and he's like it just works and it's perfect <laughs> like that's all yeah. you need to do so like that's very important because we see on social media this, these days people like to kind of show off how intelligent they are how educated they are and they might just be kind of isolating their target audience because their audience might not speak like that they might not understand that language so you need to make sure you speak in their language because they don't want to feel stupid they want you to help them but they want they don't want to feel like they're inferior because they don't understand what you're saying like you need to make it you know understandable for them and comprehensive for them because that, that's how they're going to learn and how they're going to you know actually get results from it 
yeah, a part of part of the issue is that is that majority of people who have voices in the industry have got quite big egos as well. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so the way people speak, the way people present, they're going to try and do it in obviously in the most educated way, rather than sometimes in a way that actually people listen to it, are going to work directly with clients, to coach and listen to it and how they're going to work with clients, rather than a manner they can directly relate to their, their client. They might do it in a way which is just over complex and there's too much uh, sort of terminology wise or communication wise that's actually required um, at a foundational level on, on social media. When you're studying and doing mentorships and education, that's that's different. We need to go down at a certain level. But when it's on social media, there's no re requirement for that. And trying to get something super in depth in 60 seconds or a, a couple of um, sort of slides, something like that is just is just never possible. Yeah, I think Paul has been really good at bringing that to the forefront for coaches, like telling them, you know, if your client says toned, say toned. If they say belly, say belly. Like, don't <laughs> use like abdominal region just because you think it's it's smart and, and sounds cool because you need to speak in their language to relate to them. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Goes back to Michael's, yeah. Think science, speak. Quiet. I love that phrase because obviously, like, in, initially, I struggled with that because I come from a scientific background. I've worked in science for years. I've done a degree in genetics, um, and that's how I've been taught to speak and to write. So to try and change that to speak more in the vernacular of my clients and my potential clients was hard at first, and also letting go of fact of the fact, that like, oh, am I going to sound stupid? You know, are people not going to realize that I, you know, I know this stuff and I am educated, or you know that is difficult but then you just realize like it's so much more beneficial like I like from even for me as a scientist like reading something so technical is boring you know you want something that's captivating that's interesting to read you don't want to be reading like like sometimes I feel people have captions and it looks like they just used a thesaurus for every single word and it just doesn't flow at all and it, it's just hard to read isn't it yeah yeah oh completely it's, it's when they in a sense I understand a superficial level but not really a deep level to be able to, in a sense, dumb down it and bring it down to a level where, you know, where the audience can actually fully understand it. Uh, and that's that's part and part of the the goal um, and the reason behind, so the PET project and how we're going to map out education, map out our courses. There will be a mentorship program that we map out is just to bring what is sometimes completely complex or sometimes over complex, um, and make sure trainers can go and apply that. Whether that's through live days, whether that's being taken step by step through um, on a mentorship program, because when it comes down to it, we we have to understand training. If we have to understand training, we have to understand biomechanics. Mm -hmm. Like the two come hand in hand. We can't disregard biomechanics and really what's going on internally because it it is the one thing we're in a sense um, sort of licensed to do. It's the one thing we can do. Uh, so it's trying to make sure that's that's taught at a level that's appropriate for people to apply it and then along the mentorship program we can delve a little bit deeper into it but if we don't have the application we don't want to really we're never gonna have the passion to go at a deeper level yeah. so we've got to be careful of think for some people education wise going in too deep too soon so then you don't have the passion oh, i really want to understand more i can really see the benefit of applying for this whereas that's the issue i think at the moment is a lot of people who don't fully understand exercise mechanics just see as nerds with bands or geeks who can't really build a physique who want to tweak and make things fancy when no there's so much more more to it than that but unless that old school bodybuilder or new person to the industry or something like that or client actually experiences the benefit on it and once they do then they may want to delve into it at a deeper level um so for us that's the key thing from a business perspective is can we run a couple of foundational courses that get people intrigued, get people asking questions, get people wanting to delve at a deeper level, and then uh, bring that obviously along the educational journey with them so they can go through a mentorship program, go through some more practical way stuff. That'd be really cool to like pick someone up kind of from the beginning of their journey and bring them all the way through to becoming like an expert in their field. I think that'd be really interesting because obviously it's, it's harder when you catch someone when they're far into the industry and you have to kind of unravel all the false beliefs and all the stuff that they may have been taught before and kind of reset them again. Um, but something you said, which reminds me that sticks in my head of one of the lectures that I've watched from you is the exercises invasive slide where it's, you know, you have a picture of a surgeon performing an operation and you're like, you know, we as trainers are applying forces to our clients' bodies. So it is, we need to do our due diligence and understand the effects of that and the consequences of that because it can be potentially dangerous. Um, and we can't just neglect the fact that, 
you know, there can be injuries, there can be long term issues if we don't either minimize them or, you know, take care to do things in the safest way possible. Yeah, yeah. And part and part of the problem with the industry is that most of the PTs are in their 20s most of the PTs in their 20s have got a joint tolerance that's absolutely fine and you can do certain things in terms of compromise your alignment on a leg extension do I don't know squats and your knee can go all over the place um at a high point of intensity um, and it's not going to be a problem it's going to be fine but do that for five years ten years and then something may start to go on let alone you've got that client who comes to you who played maybe a good bit of sport when they're younger train for a good five, four, four, five years, work, life, everything got in place, and then comes back to you at late 30s, early 40s. And you want to apply intensity when there's some stuff going on that might compromise joint structure. That's only going <laughs> to ask for problems. That's the thing. I was saying, so like, it's in your 20s, when we're a young PT, when I say we're inexperienced in life, <laughs> our joints are still got high tolerance, we can get away with a lot. Yeah. Um, but it's knowing that later down the line something's going to come back to bite us in the ass if we continue to apply say a certain way of setup and a certain alignment issue or something like that with a certain movements yeah i suppose it's the same thing you know smoking or using sunbeds or doing things that are going to have long-term effects is like a lot of people just seek instant gratification they don't look at the long-term consequences of things so it's it's needing to get that buy-in from them to to care and to value the longevity of training and and them as an individual as well uh, can be quite tricky yeah so like i would say like the, the best trainers the best best coaches can well often a lot of times are the ones that have fucked themselves up in some way <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> But, but that that takes you down a route, as I mentioned before, that, that takes you down a route of education, of self-exploration. Oh, how can I still train now my, my now my knee's messed up? How can I still, I don't know, put on tissue, but every time I push food, I get compromised digestion. So then I've got to figure out, okay, what's causing them digestion issues? What food is it I'm having? Um, anytime there's something messed up with us and we want to continue to progress physique-wise, then we've got to find a way. And that leads to more a sort of exploration around exercise mechanics or nutrition or whatever the topic is. Whereas if we're that lucky individual that whatever we do training wise, everything feels amazing. Whatever we do food wise, we could have a thousand calories or 5,000 calories and we just function. Okay. Mm -hmm. You'll get them people, whatever you do to them, they just tick over and they're fine. If you happen to be one of them people, you've just got them quote unquote good genetics then you're never going to realize actually how the average client may feel, mm. whether it's when you push food, whether it's when you push intensity and perform certain movements and you're trying to get them to work around different injuries and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's only once you've actually been down that route yourself, you realize that, yeah, there is a, there's a tolerance to our body. Yeah. Yeah. I almost like feel fortunate in a way that I had the struggles in the beginning because it has kind of led me to, explore and, and kind of investigate why that was like I didn't just look at a dumbbell and grow like a weed unfortunately but you know it has been a blessing in disguise because I've learned so much since that first seminar 2019 it's been what 20, 20 23 like nearly three years of just me like always trying to progress my learning and I haven't I only started coaching in 2020 so it hasn't even been very long uh, but I felt that my my education was far ahead of my actual coaching so now I'm like trying to catch up with my coaching experience with my my knowledge um, but it's definitely been really, really helpful in terms of everything. Yeah, yeah. And it's only going to put you in good stead now to have a very successful career. I hope so. <laughs> so um, <laughs> when, so we'll say a, a client comes to you and either they're, you know, they might be brand new to training or maybe they've come from a previous coach and they may have kind of residual issues or injuries. Um, what kind of considerations would you have when you're, you know, programming their training or trying to set themselves up? in terms of like hypertrophy you know but minimizing injury and, and potential health issues or anything as, as you know the the key answer in a sense the generic answer to this can be yes. independent <laughs> but I'd, I'd always use a couple of key concepts a couple of key thoughts um you always got to be aware of joints before muscles mm -hmm. a client's going to come to us a more experienced client in that I want to develop my arms. I want to develop my upper chest. I've got lagging glutes or whatever it is. But before we can go in and try and maybe have a focus on there, we need to have an understanding of what's going on within the joint itself. 
Um, so if that's obviously they want to develop the glutes, what's happening in within the sort of the hip joint to try and make sure we then can get the most from the muscles too. If we don't understand optimal alignment, optimal setup, optimal path of motion, um, then we can never build that that physique. So just as a generic sort of concept sort of thing, always understand what's going on joint first before you focus on muscles. As another thing, as a generic thing, I'd say focus on skill before progression. So focus on the client learning the skill of the movement, learning the skill of the ability to contract, learn internally what's going on before you ever think about progressing. I know for me in my early days as a PT, and I'm sure it's for the case for a lot of people that if you are working hands-on with people, you feel the way that you can provide value is to push them harder, is to push them, get them to do more. And that's the last place we can provide value. In that first, I'd say four to six weeks minimum, the place where a client's going to get a result visibly is not what we're doing in the gym is everything they do outside the gym nutrition wise lifestyle wise sleep wise recovery wise etc so what we're doing in the gym is teaching skill teaching application and then slowly we bring in progression and there's another thing maybe i'd say is we can in the exercise side of stuff is focus on path and position before profile profiles sexy making things heavier where we're stronger and lighter where we're weaker. Um, but really, it's not important in the early days. So focus on path of motion, focus on position, focus on setup that's optimal for that client, why you're teaching the skill, um, why you're aware of the, the alignment within the joint and what's going on there. And that's where they can progress to a point where you can start to push intensity. You can start to work maybe on stuff around the profile to get an optimal, um, say, profile in terms of how things feel. But without the foundations in terms of, like, is the position right for that individual for their joint and their structure? Have they learned the skill? Um, then we can't focus on some of the other, other specs of things. So it doesn't really answer your question, but give some, I think, areas that people don't think about that aren't as sexy, that they try and push a client even more. They yeah. try and match up a perfect profile. They try and put bands on things. They try and play with things when that's not important initially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the most important thing there is I think a lot of coaches will go for looking at effort and intensity first. So they'll get a training clip and they'll be like, you're not pushing hard enough. You know, you had another three reps in the tank. And that's the only thing they see. They might even skip to the end of the video just so they can see how hard they're training at the end. But they haven't, they've neglected to realize that if they can't nail the, a, a single rep, and make sure that's perfect and they have no business adding more of it because that's not going to be useful is it yes yeah yeah it's, it's understanding what maybe position is optimal for that client so getting some form of video footage on that where they're not even performing the exercise not even performing the movement so something where they're going through shoulder flexion and extension mm -hmm. through different ranges then thinking okay what movement are going to go with them from the excursion from the available range of joint motion they've got um, rather than just jumping in and thinking, okay, yes, let's look at the intensity they're performing this pull down movement or this pressing movement or whatever it is. No, let's actually look at the excursion someone's got available, what joint position, what alignment, what path of motion is optimal for them. Um, and sometimes it's always going to be a bit of an experimentation, a bit of a guess, but then we're going to continually tweak and review as we go through the process. And only once we get into the process, a matter of months down the line, are we going to start to push intensity and, and push things from that side of stuff? And do you think like when you're trying to teach a client how a contraction should feel or, you know, what their positioning should be, is that very difficult to teach online versus in person or have you kind of nailed that as well? It completely depends on the client you're, you're working with. And if majority of personal trainers are listening to this, I would say don't teach contraction too soon mm -hmm. because a lot of people have not got that mind to muscle connection i have not got that ability to switch on a muscle to initiate a contraction then it goes back to the thing of teach the movement teach the setup teach the alignment teach the position teach control and then bring in the ability to contract yeah. um but yeah 100 trying to teach someone to contract online versus face to face is so much harder because you, you can't get in and touch them you can't get in and, and feel the muscle having that ability to put your hands on the muscle and feel it um will then send the feedback to the client so then they can switch on and contract that muscle um so much easier but i think that's brought in like profiles that's brought in too soon mm. in terms of thinking clients should be able to contract mm. um, and depends the type of clientele we're working with 
yes, 99% of the clientele I work with from day one, I could tell them to get in a position and squeeze the glutes and they'd probably be able to. Um, but the general population, don't like that term, but the general population who are training with personal trainers, they won't have that ability hmm. at all. Yeah, I think, yeah, putting the cart before, before the horse in a way, because like when you taught me before and you're talking about kind of all the factors of a good rep, you know, it's the being able to start and stop uh, having that control, having that positioning, um, making sure that you're not using kind of any sort of inertia to assist you in the movement and all these kind of things that need to be on point and executed before you talk about, okay, let's now load it and let's now train to proximity failure, all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not as sexy, all that other the stuff yeah. in terms of have you got the control? Can you stop at any point within the rep? Uh, but it it needs to be the foundational things that are taught first before thinking about squeezing and contracting. Yeah. I'm I'm interested though where the idea of the profile thinking about and why people kind of prioritize that and put so much emphasis on it. Because obviously that's just one component of so many things you look into when you're setting up a movement from a mechanics perspective. I don't know whether the term profile just sounds sexy and it sounds appealing. Um, but even I've heard people talk about strength profiles of machines and stuff like that. So like some people don't even really have an understanding of what it means. Um, and the difference between like resistance profile and a magnitude profile and everything. Um, so I don't know why there's such a, a priority of that over everything else. I think it's just something that straight away you can go and apply and you, you can instantly feel the difference, whether that's in a good way or, or a bad way. But you can instantly feel the difference where sometimes if you adjust a shoulder position, degrees of internal or external rotation or whatever that may be for a joint and set up an optimal joint position or work with a machine with optimal sort of profile or optimal path, then you don't instantly feel the difference in the same way that when a movement's heavier or lighter. Um, and the thing with like path of motion as well is sometimes you just dictated by what you've got. Yeah. You haven't, you haven't got options to <laughs> make loads of different choices. You just got to work with what machines you have. Um, and then it takes a, I think a more skilled eye to then fit someone into that machine. Mm. If it's quote unquote, not say optimal. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, getting to grips with all the machine mechanics has been the most challenging for me like when there's multiple axes and there's so much going on there's like a moment arm of effort and a moment arm of resistance all this stuff that's still sometimes I have to think okay which one's which again <laughs> because it, it can be very complicated and then yeah bringing in the path of the machine and everything and how to manipulate that for the person like machines can be a bit scary sometimes <laughs> yeah and I think as the more and more different types of kit are out there you're your hoist and different things like that it's like well even the person's moving now what the yeah. hell's going on yeah and then like when you're looking at like the prime machines that purposely like try to allow you to load at various points in the range and stuff like that it can be it can be complicated like i i'm surprised when a lot of people go in and load those machines because even sometimes i'm like i don't even know how to load a prime like leg extension because it like there's so many factors that go into kind of knowing how to load it or what, what's most optimal I don't think people really I don't think people really do <laughs> that's it, my book the there. I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> that, but yeah let me ask you about that because that's a conversation I have with people all the time like what are your thoughts on being able to manipulate kind of the load in a range like say for example in the prime plate loaded or you can do it on some of the pin loaded ones as well where you can adjust the cam yeah, yeah. um personally I'd say there's like really two places to to load up them type of machines uh something that is a, a relatively even profile um so it stays pretty much similar magnitude maybe throughout or something that trends in the right direction so it gets heavier when we get stronger mm -hmm. um anything that goes against that so it's it's heaviest when we're our weakest is just inefficient mm -hmm. It's like when you've got the option to make it somewhat efficient somewhat yeah. trending the right direction I don't see why from an efficiency point of view we'd go against that unless there was something around the joint there was something we had to adjust because of certain injuries and we wanted it to be lighter where we're a bit stronger because of stuff going on um, within the joint say leg extension at 90 degrees of knee flexion you had a needle in the knee mm. so then at that point you might want to make that really light in that position but then at full knee extension you might want to then make it really heavy mm. But unless there's some exception like that, I'd always want it to either be pretty constant or at least trend trend in the right direction. Yeah. That's what I think is like 
if you have a machine like that and the, the opportunity to create as close to a congruent profile as possible, um, then why would you split it up and then try to challenge shortened range first and lengthen range after and like split it up into sets? I don't really understand why you would do that when you could just put it all together. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Like from an efficiency point of view, put it put it all together in two sets, you get the same done as what it would take three, maybe four sets. Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to know because I'm always having debates with people. Everyone's like, oh my God, we have a prime kit. And I'm like, oh, no one knows how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like if you're doing a movement that you start light and it gets you get stronger um as you go through the movement and you can set it up so it starts light and then gets heavier, just trend it in that direction and understand okay as you fatigue how do the things change do i want to set it in a way that i'm really fatigued or do i want to set it in a way that i'm quite fresh mm. um, so a pressing movement might be the fact that you actually you want the magnitude to be relatively constant throughout the range um when the high level of fatigue is there but then if you're fresh you might want the magnitude to be at a point where it does really get heavy as you push through the movement yeah, because that's like what a lot of people don't realize is that your strength profile does change with fatigue. So it's not just a constant thing all the time. Like it does change and adjust based on your fatigue level. It, it does, but not to the extent that people I think sometimes think it does. Mm -hmm. So if you do a rep of a, a set of three reps to failure um, compared to a set of 15 reps to failure, that last two to three reps of the 15 and that last one rep of the three are actually very similar profile wise. Yeah. Um, if you, if you look at it, like I've done uh, a single, for example, purposes, I've done a single arm row, um, single arm chest supported row for like one rep. And the profile on that was pretty much bang on exactly the same as what it was for a 10 rep set, six sets into the workout. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of how I fatigue through it, but it's how quickly sometimes you get there. If you it were to hold a static position, we could say then yes, with fatigue, you are a lot weaker in that maybe short range or a row compared to the length and range. Mm -hmm. But actually to get to that short position, we have to go through a concentric rep. Mm -hmm. So fatigue is always building as we're going through the rep. So on a rowing movement, we're going to have anywhere from 30 to 50 percent change in magnitude if we're looking for a congruent profile whether that's we can say fresh but we're never going to be fresh if we're training close to the proximity of failure mm -hmm. so it, it's always going to be a, a similar-ish profile it's just how much you want to trend towards what we can say is quote-unquote optimal and how much you just want to be relatively in that right direction yeah. So you might want to start at 30 kilos and drop down to 25 kilos, or you might want to start at 40 kilos and drop down to 25 kilos. They're both trending in the right direction, really. Um, but knowing under proper fatigue or close proximity to failure, whether it's three reps, whether it's 25 reps, it's going to be a similar change in magnitude we want for each. Mm -hmm. And then just to say to people, like if you think that you are training to failure for every single set you've done and you've never been to a seminar with Paula James, uh, then you need to think again <laughs> and you need to attend because I don't think you really realize what true muscular failure is until you've done a set with Paula James pushing you to the very very end because yeah I think a lot of people they use it as like a badge of honor saying I train to failure all the time but like likely they don't <laughs> yeah and if I get to try if I can, people can sort of visualize if you go back to that chest supported row example and you can handle 25 kilos in that short position then in the extended position you can handle definitely more than that we're going to call it 40 kilos but if the profile isn't congruent and it starts at a weight where you've got 15 kilos and it goes up to 25 kilos you're still going to quote unquote fail in that short range with that 25 kilos because that's the max you can handle but then every inch past that short position like you've got something in the tank mm -hmm. so yes you've hit failure but you haven't failed throughout the rest of the range other than that last sort of two three inches of that short range so able to like actually, range in the range and everything else is still good to keep going yeah, <laughs> yeah so there's so much left in the tank so we're saying oh, i had zero reps in reserve yes on that profile in that position getting to that joint position um but zero reps in reserve on that compared to a machine that maybe was set up or even spotted in a way where you started at 40 kilos and went down to that 25 kilos is gonna feel obviously night and day mm -hmm. different completely different yeah, and that's just, that's where, like, 
with volume obviously like in terms of the way that I am training at the moment it's very much to kind of we manipulate sets and kind of reps and reserve slash effort levels um but obviously volume is something that can't really be defined officially because it's going to depend so much on the machine you're using on the profile on the path on the strength profile the individual on the peak that is very very hard to make it standardized um and I can understand why people struggle with the concept because it, it is hard to kind of explain and, and actually quantifying and qualitate what it actually is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, completely. Like when you start working that out. So you did that row movement. Did that count as an elbow flexion movement? Mm -hmm. Or was that just lats? Yeah. What about stabilizing the muscles around the, the, the scapula, traps, rhomboid? Did that count as some volume from there, even though it was a lat focused movement? <laughs> so when we start putting out questions it's like oh actually there's so much more going on rather than just saying yeah i did six sets just for maybe my lap focused what about the fatigue on the biceps what about the fatigue on the stuff that stabilizes the scapula what about the fatigue on the ability to resist rotation if you're doing a, a single arm movement is that some volume in your spinal rotators mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it's just it's never possible to put an exact number on it but it doesn't mean we can't still use it it doesn't mean that we can't still try and push things up or pull things down from a volume perspective but it's it's not using it as an exact science mm -hmm. in terms of i did this amount of sets and this amount of total volume for my lats yeah that's because... why i think it's funny when you look at some websites or books and they define volume as reps time sets and you're like like you just can't simplify it to that it's just far more complicated than just sets times reps <laughs> Yeah, but you, we've got to start in a sort of simplified way to then actually have the understanding yeah. that no, yeah, it can be used as a, a tool, used as something to help with the application. Um, but we don't want to be sort of live and die in a sense by that. So if a client um, comes to you or has been working with you and they kind of, you figured out that they have weak or kind of lagging body parts they want to bring up, like what kind of things do you focus on? Do you focus on volume or is it more about, you know, execution of the exercise? Obviously, I know it's going to depend, but what kind of, things would you look at i think the first thing we need to before we start looking at a volume or execution or anything like that the first thing we need to do is try and look at the client look at their structure and understand is it a genetics thing because there are as much of people with with good genetics like to think it's not their genetics that got them a certain physique made them look a certain way that's like me saying that it's not my genetics that allowed me to play close to professional basketball like the fact that i'm six foot seven bloody helped <laughs> <laughs> the fact that someone's got a certain waist to shoulder ratio the fact that certain's got some uh, certain insertions within muscle bellies like that is going to dictate how you look that's going to dictate it and we've got to have an appreciation of genetics and if a client comes to us and oh, i've always had weak poor biceps i want to really develop my biceps they're a weak area like we have to look at that and if there's enough tissue to then <laughs> come to the conclusion and say actually where does it insert yes we know it goes down to obviously the um, radial tuberosity but it's like is it a more tendon or is it more bicep easy example obviously is to look at the calves how many times have you seen jack bodybuilders with tiny calves <laughs> And is that purely a thing that that's a, a weak body part and they don't have enough education um, of how to train the area? There might be some of that. They might not understand the full axis of the ankle and how that path excursion should go through on a calf raise movement. They might not understand how actual heavy they can do a calf raise in the length and position and how maybe light it has to be to actually get in the fully shortened position. But it's probably not really going to be the big picture. The fact is they have got, a body part which has a, a smaller muscle belly and a longer tendon mm. so we can't just assume that or think that we're we're god and we can override someone's genetics and build a weak body part i think a lot of times in within the industry in terms of building weak body parts and trying to develop people's physiques people disregard that mm. whereas actually we've got to have that conversation with a client and think okay yeah i can see you've built more tissue in this area you've got a shorter femur when you squat down your body's going to actually place tension a bit more through your quads but when i look at you look at your arms like you can see your your bicep tendon is a little bit longer um and the actual muscle belly itself is a little bit shorter so we're going to do what we can to try and make sure everything's set up optimally alignment wise profile wise frequency wise volume wise whatever that is but it's having that actual conversation with them yeah. and i think the 
probably the most area we can focus on in terms of weak body parts is when someone comes to us and there's certain stuff going on, maybe posture wise, certain stuff going on, just maybe movement wise or ability to get in certain ranges that they, they haven't experienced. That might be, say, going to a row movement and they've always stopped at a position which has made it a lat focused movement. So they haven't really got much movement through the scapula. So then we can develop mid traps, rhomboids type muscular through the mid back because now we're going to teach them how to execute stuff. Now we're going to teach them how to get movement through the scapula, movement through maybe through the thoracic, movement through the spine to that, that area. It might be that they're overemphasis on the anterior delt and they're lacking development maybe through the chest. Through optimal execution, optimal how they perform stuff, then we can work on that through adjusting their range of motion to make sure the anterior delt's not got the most advantageous sort of line of pull. And then we can try and keep a bit more emphasis on the pec. But to try and say to someone, are we going to try and develop a bit more lateral quad rather than VMO? Yes, research might say that through a certain setup, certain alignment, you can get more recruitment through there. But I'd, I'd argue over time, if you train in a certain way for five years, 10 years, then is that going to compromise structure? Mm. Is your body always going to go into a position where it is, knows it's the most, most efficient and it's got the most ability to produce force mm. properly? So under high, high levels of fatigue, if you're trying to adjust the joint position or trying to adjust alignment, it's probably going to take you back to a position it's always been on. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to think that's a, a negative view on it. It's more a view of the fact of being in the game for a long time and seeing that sometimes people don't always develop weak body parts. They just get bigger overall. Yeah. <laughs> and you can develop weak body parts to an extent, but we can't take that past an extent that's really going to change your genetics. Mm -hmm which some people put out there and I think in the industry things that yeah you can change your genetic structure and develop arms um on someone that's just not genetically built to have blessed arms mm -hmm. really um so it's understanding that what can be changed via training what have we got to sometimes live with just because it's how we built um and what if we try to change is actually going to compromise something structure wise mm -hmm. if we tr try and get our body in a certain position or certain alignment under high load under sort of continuous performance effort of high intensity is that going to compromise something joint position wise joint alignment wise because it goes back to the thing it's like what's the first thing we've got to focus on focus on joints before muscles but <laughs> within the fitness industry within our world it's focused on muscles because that's that's sexy that's going to change how you look yeah. that's going to get that before and after picture that's going to get that trophy um whereas if you sometimes have too much emphasis on that that could compromise joint structure which then can compromise the ability to develop the muscle. Mm. Um, so it's, it's understanding what is actually possible to change from a weak body part perspective and what is actually like, no, nah, you just got to live with that and we've got to build everything and present your physique in a way where your arms look bigger. Mm. Present your physique in a way that hides your calves or whatever it is. And <laughs> if you have someone who's stepping on stage, someone who's having photo shoots, there's, there's certain aspects of that. Yeah. You've, you've got to do is presenting it knowing how to present your physique how to stand um to bring certain areas out and to sort of hide certain areas as well yeah one of the examples that i thought about when you were talking about that is like you know the famous like leg extension when you have your toy, toes pointed out versus in to hit various yeah. parts of, of the pod yeah when really yeah, it's like we we can do we can do that and that will hit various parts of the quads yeah. but over time with intensity then is that, is that going to compromise the structure of the knee? Mm. Potentially. Mm. So it's like we can do certain things on paper to, to bias different areas, but it doesn't actually mean that if we try, apply that for long enough to an ability to build tissue, that the body's going to choose to bias that. The number one way that someone can visibly almost show off their ladder lap for quad is improve how they pose. Mm. Learn to contract their quads with a bit of external rotation through the knee, straight through the femur. Um, and that's going to really present more of a lateral quad, mm -hmm. really. So through presentation, through posing is sometimes the best way to go about it. Yeah, like I had my first posing lesson in ages this week, and I just forgot how hard it is to make yourself look big. <laughs> like it's just the amount of effort and work that goes in and all of the, you know, the the um, mirage that you have to put on to look a certain way. Like it is all smoke and mirrors at the end of the day. So like what you obviously you need to build the foundations, but you can do a lot of work with posing very, very well. And it, it is very hard. <laughs> 
Oh, a huge amount, a huge amount. I had Milos Zarkov coach me at, at one point in time and I remember sending pictures through to him. Um, and he was like, I oh, tweak this position and just this, just this. And you're trying to get in the position and you feel like something is cramping up. It just yeah. doesn't want to go there and stuff, let alone trying to have that on stage, have that in front of people when you're trying to look natural and look relaxed. Uh, it's, it's such a hard skill. And if you haven't been in that, that world, not that I went deep into that world, but I still touched on it. Um, you don't realize how hard that is until you actually try to do it yourself. Yeah, I was sore for a couple of days after that. And also like in being in the heels as well. It's just like, and also for a bikini, you have to be like, make sure you look smiling and happy and pretty all the time while you're doing the whole thing and slowly dying inside. So yeah, because yeah, because I did muscle model competitions. I never actually did bodybuilding. Um, I had a similar thing. I had to look chilled and happy yeah. and smiling and relaxed in my face while you're trying to hold everything locked and contracted outside of there so you couldn't show any of that expression in your face at all I know yeah, it just makes such a difference but it's just it's just so funny that obviously we, we work so hard in the gym to build our physique but even then we need extra help to kind of showcase it and like that's a really important thing because I often see people working really really hard in their training but then they step on stage and they haven't either invested in a posing coach or um practiced enough and it just goes it goes to waste because it's such a shame to have such a good physique and then not know how to demonstrate it on stage yeah, I think that's the, one of the biggest areas that people don't realize if they're going to step into that world, the amount of time, potentially the amount of investment, whether that's financially or whether that's even just time-wise, they need to put into that side of it. I think, oh yeah, I just need to hold this much tissue or be this body weight or this this condition. It's like, yes, you do, but it's you need to be able to present that. Yeah. Um, and I know I was, I was doing half an hour a day every day for that last eight weeks or so. That's constant just posing practice. Yeah. Um, prior to competing and they're like people just don't expect that you got to spend that, that much time to try and nail that side of it yeah I think like what you said as well is like a lot of males in particular get so bogged down on their stage weight and what you know what weight they're going to be and they have to be you know above 100 kilos or whatever but like when I die down this time obviously it's gonna be like three years since I last stepped on stage like it'd be nice to have some stage weight but I'm not going to yes. let that get to me because if I need to get later I need to get later there's no point in not being in shape after all that hard work just to say oh I was this I was this amount kilos up from last time like it just doesn't really matter does it oh yeah yeah not completely yeah, not at all not at all yeah so then like in terms of like training in the gym, is there is there certain things, say you go into like a commercial gym or a period gym or something like that, are there certain mistakes that you see are most common from trainers, the trainees uh, that you see that you kind of would like to correct, like if they come on board with you? Uh, probably, I, I just have to say, honestly, I, I've fallen out of touch of really what goes on in a, a pure gym or <laughs> commercial gyms. Um, once a week, I, I train in a commercial gym, but everything else, um is in, in private in a sense yeah. so you still kind of lose track of i say how majority of pts might train their clients how majority of clients in themselves uh, might train themselves uh, but the, the number one thing that anyone can try and do at that early stage is slow things down yeah. it's, it's literally sometimes that simple <laughs> if you can, can slow things down then you can start to teach things then you can start to implement certain adjustments positions tweaks things like that it's, trying to think of an analogy that if you're looking at a sprinter and you want to work on their technique you're not going to do that while going at full pace you're not going to do that while sprinting you're going to slow them down you're going to adjust stuff you're going to take them away and then you're going to build stuff back in it's no different when, when we're training if we're training at high intensity or high speed to be able to adjust that we've got to slow things down so to warrant trying to make it more explosive trying to make it quicker if that is the end goal We've got to do it slower mm. to then be able to go back into it and do it quicker. So from an oversimple sort of a term or something like that, that's the more someone can slow stuff down, the more someone can be aware of each part of the rep, each part of the movement, the more then you can try and progress that and move on from there. Well, it's not even commercial gyms either, because I see like very high level athletes with kind of you know certain coaches that like a famous one I always think about is like a seated cable row and they're just literally flinging the stack back and forth as they do and like moving their whole body and like I see like pro level people still doing this yeah yeah it's because at, at that level what's got them to be a pro is their genetics yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> like like what, what got me to the point of playing a high level of basketball was 
so much down to my genetics yeah. yes there's the skill and obviously the dedication other things we can build into i'm not trying to take away from the dedication and the stuff some of the high level athletes have but the reason a lot of them will build a certain physique is just down to their genetics yeah. and that's why it's really important to visualize these things like i know paul has a video on youtube where he's using the luggage scale and showing what happens when he just yanks the cable and how like you're virtually lifting nothing at that point and um, so when you can literally see it right there it kind of drills it into your head whereas if someone just tells you you're like oh whatever you know it's worked all this time so might as well keep going yeah. but uh yeah so on to that do you want to talk about your upcoming seminar that you have on um it's obviously the first event for the pt project yes yeah our first uh say live day first event uh 16th of july in birmingham at mk health hub um right near the train station easy easy location to get to um it's very nice but it's, it's as a well, so yes there. yeah beautiful beautiful gym beautiful location nice little hookup <laughs> we've got there um with that one and it's really a day where we're going to start to explore what's going on within the world of exercise mechanics um a lot of a lot of breakouts a lot of discussion and yes it will be at a foundational level a lot of people obviously have studied with us before and they're like oh should i should i come on to this i've studied through the education portal yeah before i studied with some of the live days and like the more we go through this stuff the more it really sits in and even if you can come to an event, come to something and pull two, three, four points from it, I would say there's value in that. Because what we're charging for it is an absolute bargain. I was shocked at how cheap day. it was. I, I literally <laughs> looked at the price and I was expecting the normal price. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's so cheap. <laughs> Uh, because we know that it's going to build on to other things and yeah. as i said previously for someone to get onto the point of trying to go through a mentorship program and to delve at a deeper level in it and obviously a higher price sort of product they've got to experience it they've got to they've got to feel it they've got to see it so we want to get as many people to be able to do that within this initial day as possible so they come and do some further education with us and further study in because that's we're really where you're gonna i say master it or really you're really gonna take it to another level um but it's like you've, you've got to see it firsthand if you're someone who's purely studied online from exercise mechanics point of view you need to study it face to face yeah like like i always get it. um i get messages all the time people saying i really want to get into mechanics what book should i read i'm like do not read a book go to a seminar go to an event and then la let that dictate where you go from there because you just need to see it in person yeah yeah you've got to see it you've got to be taken through a set you've got to experience certain exercises certain movements and with certain tweaks adjustments and, oh that felt completely different that can change completely how that movement felt until you really get that experience you're never going to have the passion to go and maybe read that appropriate book that might need reading at some point but that's not the first port of call um, really so it's it's a foundational understand exercise mechanics that really is going to give people key concepts to go and run with go and take away whether that's individual exercises whether that's how to put programs together whether it's looking at different things that are going on with different type of clients um but to really give as much key practical takeaways um, as possible yeah and i can certainly vouch like i think i've been to four of your educational seminars now um i've done one-to-one -one mentoring with paul before and like i can hand on heart say you guys are the most passionate and animated and excited and interesting educators that i've learned from like you are just it just the passion that you have for the actual field just exudes through in person i think in person is, is a lot you get a lot more from it than if it's like obviously zoom is, is a great tool but there's nothing like seeing it in person visualizing it touching things adjusting things and just being in that environment of a team or a community of people who are all there for the same reason who are all supportive and open to questions and open to being wrong because we're all it's all okay if we're wrong um, and it's just it's just an incredible environment i just love it and like as i said like it's a very very inexpensive price this first one so i would say get on it if you're thinking about it because it is so valuable and so worth the investment yeah like what you mentioned there as well just being in a room of like-minded professionals is yeah. is huge if you're a coach who works at pure gym works in a little studio something like that it can be a very very lonely place and you haven't got other sort of um sort of pts and other coaches to bounce ideas off discuss stuff so starting to build your network um, and know another personal trainers can that in itself can be massive massive value so if you're passionate about edu education and passionate about exercise mechanics and want to sort of network with other coaches you are as well it's a sort of ideal place ideal environment for that as well 
I just got crack as well. Like I always come away on a high. Like if anyone saw my, like I was on a testimonial for the last seminar you did with the muscle mentors. And I was just like so excited because I just had a whole like day of learning. And I was just, you just feel euphoric because you've learned so much. You've had a great time. Like everyone's so interested. Like it's just, it's just a really nice environment. So yeah, if, if anyone's interested, I hundred percent, if you're on the fence, just go for it because you won't look back. And I've, le- I've made so many friends. I've got to know so many people in the industry. It brings about way more opportunities as well. Like from my knowledge, I, I never would have become like a part of the physique collective. And I, I never would have had the opportunities I've had without this foundational knowledge and, and that pursuit of education. I know half my colleagues that are currently sort of in the industry. I probably never would have known if there hadn't been something education related, whether in the early days that was them listening to me, <laughs> really, because a lot of the guys, even within, say, the Muscle Mentors and stuff like that, um, had come to some of the camps that, that were M10. And a lot of the people that I just know in the industry and that I've either been to their education or they've been to some of the stuff I've done. Um, so from a networking point of view, it's, it's huge and never undervalued the um the network of people that you know and the coach you know and where that can potentially lead to things in the future yeah it's actually really important like I'm surprised at how like just networking through events and seminars has led to so many opportunities so just you need to put yourself out there and just go to things even if you're by yourself yeah. like I go to things by my own by myself all the time like don't wait for someone to come with you just go by yourself still make friends when you're there oh 100 yeah yeah everyone's going to be in a, a similar boat as well so Cool. So where can people find you? How can they sign up for the upcoming event? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So social media is just James underscore Sutton underscore coaching. Um, If you go on my Instagram, then you'll see a link in my bio through to the PT projects, uh, breaking down biomechanics uh, one day event. So follow that through. And obviously don't follow me on social followers. Um, Always posting educational stuff around exercise mechanics. Yeah, your infographics are really helpful. I really enjoy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying, trying to be more on it social media wise. Oh, but as we all know, I'm really impressed because even like the design of the infographics looks really good. Because like my canvas skills are not the best. So like when I see things like that, I'm like, that's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie and take credit I have got someone who does my camera stuff for me that makes sense to, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so, to make you feel better I'd like to brag and say I've got credit for that but yeah, uh, yeah design on camera is not my forte the importance of outsourcing things that you can't do yourself <laughs> pays off yes 100 yes yeah don't feel bad about that perfect well thank you guys so much for tuning in and thank you James for joining me on this episode If you guys did enjoy it, I'd appreciate if you took a screenshot, shared it to your story, tagged myself and James, we'd really appreciate it. Let us know if you enjoyed and until next time, we'll see you soon.